This is CBC Here and Now. June 7th, the day Courtney Lake disappears, her ex-boyfriend pleads guilty to assaulting her. Heritage home owner accused of setting fire to his own building. The child advocate speaks about recent youth suicides in Natwashish. The losses are unfathomable. It's, it's not just heartbreaking. Well, Canada Day is still a couple of days away, but we've got some early fireworks in terms of thunderstorms, both tonight and again on Friday. The details are coming up. There are new details tonight coming from the court records of Courtney Lake's ex-boyfriend. Philip Smith's East End home was searched by police yesterday afternoon. Here now is Megan McCabe is live outside Smith's residence on Alice Drive. So Megan, what do we know? got Smith's court records earlier today and we're getting a picture of a potentially abusive relationship between 25 year old Philip Stephen Smith and 24 year old Courtney Lake. On June 5th, two days before Lake was last seen, Smith was charged with breaching a court order to stay away from Lake and her mom, Lisa Lake. Then on June 7th, the very day that Lake disappeared suspiciously, Smith was in court pleading guilty to assaulting her six weeks earlier. He was convicted of that assault and released on conditions. Now, also on June 7th, Smith is charged with breaching a couple of those conditions by driving while disqualified and failing to stay away from Lisa Lake, Courtney Lake's mother. Both of those things happened in Mount Pearl. Mount Pearl is also the last place that Courtney Lake was seen. At 7.52 p.m., she was walking away from her mom's house on Wellington Crescent and no sign of her since. As for Smith, he is not charged in connection with Lake's disappearance, but he is in police custody. He was arrested Tuesday for breaching a court order. And uh, police have told us just late this afternoon, they said tomorrow morning they'll be giving an update on the investigation into Courtney Lake's disappearance. I'll have more on this story later in the show, but for now, reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Megan McCabe in St. John's. Well, there's more trouble at the College of the North Atlantic tonight. Two months ago, the province released a report that said the college has serious problems, including a lack of emphasis on teaching and learning. Now, one of its programs, respiratory therapy, has been suspended because it's lost its certification. As here and now's Avneet Dillon reports, that's leaving some students in limbo. I think it was the epitome of unprofessional. Heather White just completed her first year in the respiratory therapy program at CNA. Her class was informed of the program's suspension through a press release. She hopes the school can come up with a solution, but isn't holding her breath. Right now, we're researching other programs in case it really doesn't go our way and they won't do anything for us. Students were frantically calling the Federation of Students yesterday, and the group is frustrated with the college's response. They're really not giving uh, students alternatives and solutions, even if they do reimburse tuition fees. There's uh, the co other costs, uh, living expenses and time. The college's senior vice president of academics told me the program suspension is a wake-up call for the college. But it's the lack of transparency that's raising questions about the institution. The school didn't notify students when the program was put on probation. It is really problematic for an institution to not disclose all the information within the, uh, of the program uh, when students are making life decisions based on that. White says Newfoundland and Labrador is losing talented healthcare professionals if the suspension is permanent. I have a class of very hardworking friends and they're a group of the most compassionate people I know. This province and its hospitals are the worst for the fact that they won't have my class practicing as respiratory therapists in it. Students are still searching for answers. Heather says that the school is trying to see whether students who are already enrolled can still write the national licensing exam so they can return to studies here at CNA. But if that doesn't happen, there's no plan B. Avneet Dillon, CBC News, St. John's.
Newfoundland and Labrador Hydro says it will take about a month to inspect steel towers erected as part of the new Beta Spare to Chapel Arm transmission line. Occupational Health and Safety has ordered the towers for the Muskrat Falls transmission line and the power line being built between Beta Spare and the Western Avalon be inspected by a professional engineer. The inspections and a review of the installation process were ordered following a tower collapse 10 days ago near Cumbai Chance that killed two men. More than 230 towers have to be inspected and government has ordered a stop work order on the installation of any new towers. Well, there's a big development tonight involving a fire that damaged a heritage building in St. John's last year. The co-owner of the Waterford Manor has been charged with arson. Emergency crews received reports of an explosion and fire on the top floor of Waterford Manor bed and breakfast in July of last year on July 7th. Up to 45 firefighters spent more than 12 hours battling the fire in the 110-year-old building in the west end of the city. Now, the RNC believe the 40-year-old co-owner, David Badrudin, started the fire, and now he's scheduled to face a charge of arson in court in early July. A forest fire is growing in central Labrador. The out-of-control blaze has quadrupled in size since being reported last night. It's now burning 225 hectares of forest by the Churchill River across from an unoccupied Muskrat Falls work camp. Fire officials say that's where resources are being concentrated. Two helicopters and a water bomber are in the air and seven firefighters are on the ground. Well, if you've been to downtown St. John's, you may have crossed paths with Stormin Norman. Now, his real name is Norman Courtney, and over time, he became part of the downtown community. But Courtney died last week. Here and now's Nakshi Pandit has that story. As someone who was known for his kindness to others, this is where Norman Courtney received kindness. The employees of this barber shop were close to him. Um, sorry. Yeah, we're really going to miss him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he spent a lot of time down here, a lot with our clients. Yeah, we spent a lot of time here. A few years ago, the team organized an effort to raise money for Norman. They put his face on a t-shirt. He sold them, and he got the profits. So we put the t-shirts out, and then we just would give him like cash every single week for it. And he bought a lot of food, a lot of Pepsi, a lot of pizza, <laughs> but yeah, it was good. It was a good little project for him. This is a spot where Norman spent a lot of his days. He's popular around here, and a lot of people from this community are remembering him fondly. I remember a few times when I was just usually just outside sometimes, and he'd come by and he'd always have some kind of story to tell me. And uh, I'm a student, so he always used to come by and tell me how Although he uh, never got the opportunity to go get an education himself, he was like, you need to go and get an education. He seemed content with what he had, which made room for him to give back. If he did mention money, he'd always say, do you need some, which was kind of funny. Or he would, uh, if he was always watching for the parking attendants to make sure nobody was getting tickets in their cars and uh, keeping an eye out for that while people ran into different stores. While Storm and Norman won't be present anymore, his spirit of kindness will live on. Nakshi Pandit, CBC News, St. John's. She marched right up to the stage after her number was drawn at Chase the Ace last night in Goulds. The question is, how much did she walk away with? The answer in about three minutes.
What's this really crazy last <laughs> I don't know where it comes from. It's really deep inside. <laughs> and uh, when he starts, it's a little hard for him to stop and a little hard for us not, not to start as well. <laughs> I didn't know he chuckled that. like that. Yeah. <laughs> it is a deep laugh. <laughs> so, how's so, the weather? <laughs> uh, well, we've got uh, some active weather. And as I mentioned off the top, uh, Canada Day obviously is Saturday and also Memorial Day. Mm -hmm. uh, looking forward to fireworks, which should be dry. I'll give you a little early oh, preview. We will be watching some showers early Saturday, but it looks like some clearing. Uh, and pretty much everyone uh, dry for Saturday night for the fireworks time. But some early Mother Nature fireworks uh, uh, before the weekend. And we have been watching a line today that, uh, as expected, has been moving in from the west and has been sparking up some thunderstorms over the northern peninsula and northwestern parts of Newfoundland. The Bayvert Peninsula into the uh, Notre Dame Bay area has been very active uh, for this afternoon. And there is the latest radar snap, and you can see where lots of activity up towards the White Bay area over the Bayvert Peninsula, Notre Dame Bay, and then stretching down towards Buckins. A few rumbles of thunder uh, likely here as well. And this is all rolling northeastward. Radar not doing a great job, but also a cell up just to, to the northeast near uh, uh, the Fogo Island region. And so active all through that northern Bay of Exploits region over the next few hours. Pretty solid cell there looking uh, near Springdale. Heavy downpours with this lightning and likely not even ruling out a little bit of hail uh, with this line that's again working from east uh, from west to east that is and will be pushing through central over the next few hours before things calm down after sunset. We've been looking at some active weather and a few uh, lightning strikes over southeastern parts of Labrador uh, through the day today. Uh, primarily right now all the strikes are south of Labrador City and Happy Valley Goose Bay. You can see as we roll through this evening into the overnight how things become quiet for most of the island. Still some lingering scattered showers for the northern peninsula across into central parts of Newfoundland for tomorrow morning. There's a slight risk from Cartwright to Happy Valley Goose Bay back across to Labrador City, but this will all sink southward and we'll see a clearing trend through Labrador through the day tomorrow. It's a quiet start for Newfoundland, but the exact opposite is things will turn active through the day and we'll break that down in just a moment. Starting near 10 degrees in St. John's, Beautiful, bright start. I think temperatures tomorrow in Metro are going to range from 21, 22 to as warm as 23, 24 degrees uh, for our high for the Metro region for tomorrow in the Northeast Avalon in particular. 18 and a fine looking Friday evening on the menu as well. Have a look at highs again, 22 to 24 in Metro. I think Fairland is actually going to be closer to 20 degrees, uh, but cooler right along the water near 16 and we are looking at 22 along the Buren Peninsula tomorrow. There's a slight risk, 30 to 40 percent chance that uh, Clarenville Bonavista get into a shower or thunderstorm for tomorrow, but I did include it in my forecast. Better chance certainly from Terranova, Gander, Twillingate, Grand Falls, Windsor. This is where we're talking north of 60 percent to 70 percent chance of seeing some showers and certainly some thunderstorms and a very good chance from the Bayvert Peninsula once again down through Springdale and areas west of Grand Falls, Windsor. Nice day along that south coast for tomorrow. Should mention, mention Central will have a, a beautiful start to the day. Some sun and cloud on the menu and then it's that late day risk. Same thing through the west coast. A quiet start to the day. The active weather moves in into the afternoon in the form of showers and a risk of thunderstorms as far south as Stephenville. Even a st scattered risk for Port of Basque for tomorrow. The northern peninsula up into southeastern Labrador. Cool temps with winds in from the north. We're talking about single digit temperatures. The north coast will see some bright skies through Nain. Early drizzle in Makovic clears 17 to 18 degrees from Happy Valley Goose Bay to Labrador City with again some clearing skies, which is the good news. Now we will be watching a system that's going to be rolling in for Saturday. The good news is it will be raining. Yeah, not good news in the morning, but the good news is it will be clearing into the afternoon. As I mentioned, I'll break down your weekend forecast in full detail coming up in just a few minutes. Debbie. Well, if you bought a Lotto 649 ticket in Stephenville, you should check your numbers. A ticket sold in the community for last night's draw is worth more than $4 million. It is one of three winning tickets, splitting a total jackpot of almost $13 million. The other winning tickets were sold in Ontario and Quebec. 
And speaking of lotteries, the deck is dwindling, but the jackpot and the crowds are growing for the Goulds Chase the Ace lottery. The grand prize of close to half a million dollars went unclaimed last night after hundreds of people streamed into the Goulds neighborhood of St. John's for a shot at winning the St. Kevin's Parish fundraiser. Here and now's Jeremy Eaton was there. As you can see, Bob is stirring them around. <laughs> If that lucky person cuts, uh, touch, chooses the ace, they will have a jackpot of $430,717. And if not, a constellation of $46,983. Take it out, just point at it and point, put your finger around it. And I'll take it. Are you ready? Choose one. Choose one. Keep your finger on that card. I'm going to take everything else away, and Bob is going to turn over the card. Are you ready? Yes, I'm ready for whatever it is. I'm ready! Woo! Jack and Doug. Jack and Doug. Forty-six thousand. Yeah. How does that feel? Oh my God! <laughs> Woo! Fantastic. So, so you had a bit of a story. You're a bit out of breath when you and your daughter got here. What happened? Yes, because we ran into traffic and we had to get out of the car and run halfway. <laughs> had to run for about five minutes. <laughs> so how did it feel to get here? What was it like trying to select the last one of the last fifteen cards? Oh my God! It's just mind-boggling because you're looking at every single card and. My finger was saying, no, this one, no, that one, this one. So, boom. It's good. It's all good. But it's not all good for everyone. At least one person living in the Goulds is not happy with the Chase the Ace excitement. John Peddle is so annoyed with the traffic jam caused by the fundraiser, he started a Facebook group called Ban the Ace. And by this afternoon, the group had 72 members. Peddle told the St. John's Morning Show that he's not against the fundraiser itself. He just feels the location is not conducive to high volume traffic. Up next, the Child and Youth Advocate weighs in on the problems in Labrador's inner communities.
Children taken from their communities and placed in foster care, drug abuse and suicides. This is the alarming reality for some in the inner communities of Natwishish and Sheshishi. The anguish of the situation was for all to see in recent stories on Here and Now. Young people who recently took their lives in Sheshishi, including a mother after her son's own suicide. It's turmoil because people have a lot of grief. Thunderheart Jakapesh of Natwishish killed himself in May. He had substance abuse problems, but stints in rehab far from home couldn't save him. Child your family services is not the answer for our people. And Pierre Gregoire of Sheshishi died of an overdose in Toronto after years of foster care and drug abuse. It weighs heavy on the Grand Chief of the Innu Nation, who says these problems go back years, despite repeated calls for help. We've been at the doorsteps of government for the last 30 years, saying that things need to change. Now the province's child and youth advocate is weighing in. In a release last week, Jackie Lake Cavanaugh says the need to act is immediate. We spoke at her office this morning. Jackie Lake Cavanaugh, you have seen our stories. You've recently visited Labrador. What's your sense of how urgent these problems are? Debbie, I can't say how urgent these problems are. Uh, we've seen these unfolding for years and years and years. We've seen them here in the province, and we've seen the national picture unfold as well. Uh, it's heartbreaking. It's very, very troubling that we're seeing uh, children and youth in indigenous communities in the province who are struggling. And the recent um, uh, deaths, the suicide deaths and the injuries of children in Natwishish is a prime example of, of what that looks like. Um, and I think that, you know, at this point in time, it's really important to acknowledge that the system of services to children as we have it now um, is not viable for the future. This is not something that we can sit back and say the status quo will be satisfactory. It's not serving children well. You mentioned the recent suicides and the Deputy mm -hmm. uh, Chief of the Inner Nation, Simeon Jakapesh, recently lost his 16-year-old son to suicide. Yeah. He has been railing against government, uh, the, the department mm -hmm. responsible, uh, begging for change, advocating for change. Mm -hmm. It goes back decades, and I'd like you to have a look at some of what he's said over sure. the years. Sure. They just want to commit suicide. That's what they told me. Just want to die right there. They were screaming in my face. I want to die. I want to die. I want to hang myself. I don't care if I die. We're going to be extinct. It's not going to solve all the problems. Yes, it's going to solve all the living conditions that we, we've been suffering, Davis. Once we settle in the community like this, this is not Ashish, and we will deal those problems. It's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take a long, hard work for us. At least we're going to be comfortable in our houses and to deal with these problems. Younger people are dying. Now, this is probably the fourth death in our community, in Atwashish, ever since we moved uh, a year ago. When I lost my nephew last weekend, I thought a lot of things that I, I, I'm not going to quit over these young people. And now I'm advocating for my son today. And this is the hardest part, I think, that I ever be able to speak publicly. The system has failed our, our, our youth. So Jackie, these problems go back decades. How much longer before there's some real solutions? Well, I mean, when you look at those clips, I mean, the losses are unfathomable. Uh, from my perspective now, Debbie, I think that um, the province is really in a position to turn the page and make some real meaningful changes. Um, the Department of Children, Seniors and Social Development has just wrapped up uh, its review of its legislation and I understand there were pretty extensive consultations. There was uh, feedback uh, and significant input from Indigenous communities. And I think that, you know, this is a real time to be able to 
redesign those services. Uh, and what I would like to see and what, you know, uh, the Indigenous communities have long advocated for is that it would be a much more empowered approach for the communities. They would be supported to deliver more services within the communities. Uh, what specifically would you like to see in that legislation? I would like to see much stronger provisions for um, uh, a more active process of delivering services within uh, Aboriginal communities by Aboriginal communities. Uh, when I was in Labrador there a few months ago, you know, I, I heard very clearly that there's a greater capacity to do more themselves within. And is that something like more foster care That's in one of the, the things. That's one of the things, yeah. How about a treatment centre in the community? How about yeah. parental counselling? Absolutely, counseling? yes. All of those kinds of things I think would be really important. I mean, when we heard uh, Grand Chief Kupi last week, you know, she talked about, you know, it begins at home. There's community accountability. And then it's important for governments to collaborate and work together so that it's, it's an overall um, fabric of services that fits and meets the needs of the communities. And I think that if there's more of um, an approach where communities are active players, active partners uh, in delivering those services in ways that are meaningful for them because the cultural piece is really significant for Aboriginal communities. You know, the healing approaches uh, may be, uh, you know, uh, land-based. They may uh, integrate components of, um, you know, spirituality. Um, things that, you know, would not look the same in St. John's treatment services, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, but I think that's really important to make sure that the services fit the need. Like when I heard um, Deputy Grand Chief Chakovich talking about, you know, children having to go thousands of miles away for culturally appropriate services, almost to the other end of the country. How difficult that must be for a young person who's struggling already to have to go thousands of miles away from this little community that's always been home to them. How much weight does your office bring to this situation? I think that, you know, what's important to understand about our, our office is that it is not a government department. It is an independent agency that reports to the House of Assembly. So we're able to uh, draw attention to areas where we would like to see government move in in developing more comprehensive and meaningful approaches to services to children and youth. And you're going back to Labrador soon. We're in the process of arranging that right now. When I came into this position first, just before Christmas, I fully understood and recognized that there were huge challenges in Labrador and I wanted this office to have a much more meaningful uh, connection, involvement and a presence in Labrador. And so I made it my business right away to make sure that I got on the ground and went up the north coast and I plan now to go back again this summer. We're working out some details around dates right now actually. Anastasia Cupid said to me last week in our interview, I have to have hope. What would you say to her today? Absolutely, absolutely. I remember flying back on the plane Friday night after my week in Labrador um, this past winter. And I remember thinking of all the challenges and of all the difficulties that are being faced, I had a, a tremendous sense of hope because the compassion, the dedication, the commitment of people that I met was absolutely overwhelming and I thought you know there are people here that can make a difference and there are people here that can bring services to children and youth to a very different place. Coming up next we go back to our top story and the St. John's neighborhood where police have been as the search continues for a missing woman. Megan McCabe will tell us what area residents are saying.
Well, back now to our top story. There are new details tonight about Philip Smith. He's Courtney Lake's ex-boyfriend. Lake went missing on June 7th and police deemed her disappearance suspicious. Here now is Megan McCabe joins us now live. So Megan, have you heard from Courtney Lake's family? Uh, yes, I have. I've been speaking with them over the course of the day. And, you know, as we know, Lake has a six year old son, so they're very concerned that it's been three weeks since his mom was last seen. And you know, her family tells me that things were really starting to go well for Courtney. She had a new boyfriend who was a really sweet man and her ex-boyfriend was convicted of assaulting her the very day she was um, disappeared. Like he was convicted for the assault that happened back in April. And he'd also been ordered to stay away from Lake and her mom, but he was completely disregarding that obviously. And you know, it's quiet here on Alice Drive this evening, but it yesterday the street was just bustling with police uh, removing items from this house here, 22 Alice Drive, where Philip Smith lived. Neighbors tell me that they don't know much about Smith. He's lived here for a couple of years, but they had seen Courtney here within the past few months, right on the step of that house and also at the neighborhood store. And they also told me that police have been canvassing this area just last week, asking anyone if they had seen Lake and uh, searching all of the properties around. But as far as we know, absolutely nothing. However, we are hoping and we understand now that we will get a significant update from the police 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. And they also tell us that there'll be new digital media, so new video to go along with the information they have about Lake's disappearance. I'll be there and so you should follow CBC to get the latest as we learn it. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Megan McCabe in St. John's. Well, millions of people would agree having the internet, social media and texting at your fingertips can be a great convenience. But new research suggests just having your smartphone nearby, even if you're not using it, can be a brain drain. Nicole Ireland has more. How often do you do this to avoid being distracted by your smartphone at work? According to a new study, just having your smartphone nearby, even if it's turned off, could affect your performance. Researchers at the University of Texas at Austin had more than 500 undergraduate students do tests, math problems, memorizing, completing patterns, to measure their cognitive function. While they were in the testing room, some of the students were allowed to have their smartphones face down on their desks. Others kept their phones nearby in their pockets or bags, and others weren't allowed to bring their phones into the room at all. In all cases, the phones were silenced. Even though none of the students could use their smartphones, those who had their phones physically close by performed significantly worse on the tests. The study authors say that's because people are so used to having access to the internet, apps and text messages in the palm of our hands that the act of trying to ignore the smartphone sitting in front of us actually takes brain power, meaning there's less cognitive capacity left to devote to the task we're trying to complete. The researchers emphasize that this study looked at very specific cognitive tasks and depending on what kind of work we do, having a smartphone could be particularly useful, especially if we're looking up information online. But the study authors suggest that we be conscious of the effect that smartphones can have on our brain power and think about putting them away every once in a while. Nicole Ireland, CBC News, Toronto. In investigators on PEI are now examining the carcass of a dead whale, trying to figure out how the animal died. It's one of six right whales that have died recently in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Nicole Williams has the latest, but first a warning, some of the video may be disturbing to some viewers. Here on the shores of Norway, a crowd of researchers from across the island and North America are beginning the necropsy of a North Atlantic right whale. They began this morning by moving the whale off the beach and dragging it further onto land. That's all so that researchers can finally cut open the whale which had been floating in the ocean for about a week or so. A dead North Atlantic right whale was first spotted off the coast of the Magdalen Islands on June 7th, and since, six in total have been found in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. In the last few weeks, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans and Marine Biologists have tracked down the whales and done brief evaluations of the bodies in the water. Now they've brought one to shore to finally start searching for answers. That's the one thing with a lot of these animals is that looking at them on quick glimpse, you're like, there's not really a lot to see 
in the immediate sense, and that's why the necropsies were so important, because a lot of the evidence is actually internal with these animals. Work is expected to take at least two days. That's because of the sheer amount of bone and blubber they'll have to cut through to get to the organs. It's hard work made more difficult because of the precious numbers of this whale species left. When you deal with a mass mortality, considering the relatively small size of the population of right whales in the northwest Atlantic. I call it a mass mortality. Researchers here say they've never seen anything else like it, which is why they're so anxious to get work underway, hoping to find a cause of death and prevent this from happening again. The ocean is very precious. When something like this happens, when we don't know what caused the mortality, we have to worry. Their goal is to locate up to two other whales and bring them to shore, performing further necropsies to try and determine any similarities. And the next step for this team will be to collect and send off samples for testing. After that, they'll be tasked with burying the bodies on the shores of this beach. Nicole Williams, CBC News, Norway, Prince Edward Island. The weather update is brought to you by Belltone Hearing Service St. John's. Helping the world hear better. Welcome back, everyone. Yeah, so Ryan, you are uh, looking at the weekend forecast. A lot of people wondering uh, about their plans, yeah. about outdoor plans. So a little bit of everything this weekend. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> uh, over yeah. a three-day period, uh, we will see a little taste of everything. In fact, uh, thunderstorms in the mix uh, tonight and again tomorrow. Don't think we'll see any thunder on the weekend but uh, or hear any thunder, but we will certainly see some showers but also some sunshine. So uh, you're going to need uh, both the sunglasses and the umbrella as you uh, head out to uh, whatever plans you have on the menu as we take a look at your weather on the way headlines. Yeah, Friday fireworks in the form of thunderstorms, showers and sun for Canada Day, Memorial Day and unsettled this long weekend in terms of some showers. The uh, temperatures are going to be quite variable as well uh, as we have winds both from the north and the south this weekend to deal with. This is the disturbance that we've been watching spark up some showers and thunderstorms over central parts of Newfoundland and western parts of the island and southern parts of Labrador for this afternoon and this evening. That takes off, but a new disturbance moves in Friday afternoon. Again, it's a quiet day for eastern Newfoundland. Quiet start for central and west, but there are those thunderstorms and showers heavy at times that'll be bursting through into the scene for Friday afternoon. Clearing out nicely through Labrador as uh, the unsettled weather sinks south there, though the northern peninsula and southeastern parts of Labrador uh, will certainly be uh, damp for most of the day. 17 to 18 degrees across southern Labrador tomorrow. We're into the 20s and likely in that 23 to 24 degree range here for St. John's and the metro region. This is the low that will be bringing in some rain for Friday night into Saturday morning. And so unfortunately for the early morning Signal Hill ceremonies, I do have rain in my forecast. And in fact, I think that rain extends all the way up to the northeast coast and central. Things clear into the afternoon but in behind the low, the winds shift to north. So that will basically cap our temperature. I think we're going to be limited to about 13, 14 degrees. Temps start to slide as that northerly wind really starts to punch in for later afternoon into the evening hours. 16 the high for central, uh, 19 for western parts of Newfoundland. Again, uh, looking at that sun and cloud mix there with those showers departing well before uh, sunrise. Now, Canada Day for the fireworks in the evening then with that low departing, I think we're dry. You can see the precip here well to our south. Uh, temperatures though with those northerly winds, I think are going to be in that 8-9 degree range, even a little bit cooler right along that northeast coast in those onshore winds. So we'll We'll obviously keep that uh, keep you posted on that. Another update on those temperatures for tomorrow. By Sunday morning, we are looking at that area of high pressure moving in. Our next system is on the doorstep, so this is a very active pattern. One system departs, the next one moves in. And so by Sunday afternoon, showers are into western Newfoundland. I think they are arriving in central, hopefully not until later day. And it's a late day risk even for St. John's in the east as well as Happy Valley Goose Bay. Best chance is certainly western regions of the province. Now for Monday, we are are looking at showers for western parts of Labrador with cool temps, scattered showers for possible for Happy Valley Goose Bay, an isolated risk for central and west, and looking at some morning showers for St. John's. I think things will dry out into the afternoon, but I'm not sure we'll see much in the way of sunshine uh, as things really obviously depend on the timing. Still a few days out, uh, but certainly drier into the afternoon. There are those temperatures, which again will be certainly the best of the best uh, in terms of 
the highs from Monday, and you can see where we're hanging on to the 20s into early next week, which is, I guess, good news, although it's not the weekend. Uh, and uh, for Labrador, there are your uh, great-looking Saturday as things caught up and cool down for Sunday into Monday. Let's meet our young athlete of the day, Alex Cal of Whitlands Bay, seven years old, and plays with two teams, the Southern Shore Breakers and the Yetman Flyers. And the Flyers won a gold medal at the tournament in Montreal in May. Alex enjoys watching here and now and uh, seeing all the young athletes like him. Well, that's <laughs> awesome news, and uh, thanks for uh, joining the list, Alex. You're today's Young Athlete of the Day. You've likely heard this tune before and you're probably going to hear it over and over again. This is Ed Sheeran's chart-topping hit, Shape of You. Yes, he's actually had 16 out of 20 songs on the UK official singles chart this year and it's gotten so ridiculous that new rules are being introduced limiting artists to only three songs on the singles chart at once. Now to some national and international news. Never before have sexual assault allegations reached this high in the Catholic Church. Australian police have charged top Vatican official for child sex crimes. Cardinal George Pell is the head of finance and considered the third most powerful official in the church. Megan Williams has more. Cardinal George Pell wasted no time in calling a press conference at the Vatican to declare his innocence of the charges of child sexual assault and to say he looks forward to defending himself in court. There have been leaks to the media. There have been, there's been relentless character assassination. Cardinal Pell, like any other defendant, 
has a right to due process. Police in Victoria, Australia say the charges relate to alleged incidents from the past and were made by several different people. Pope Francis appointed Pell, a conservative Catholic, to the position of Vatican treasurer three years ago. The cardinal has been facing accusations for years that he covered up child sexual abuse by priests in Australia. That's before more recent accusations that he abused children himself. In an Australian Royal Commission on Sex Abuse last year, Pell admitted the Catholic Church had made what he called enormous mistakes in believing priests over victims, which allowed sexual abuse to go on for years. The Australian Cardinal says the Pope granted him a leave of absence to fight the charges in court. The accusations are a hard blow to Pope Francis on an issue many say he is weak on. The most credible members of a commission Francis set up to protect children from sex abuse have resigned, saying the Vatican stonewalled any attempts at reform. Megan Williams, CBC News, Venice. Well, many Indigenous people are planning to mark July 1st as a day of protest. They say Canada's 150th birthday should also be a reminder of the challenges they still face. Celebrating 150 years of Canada, right? Um, on top of that, though, it's, you know, 150 years of like, genocide, assimilation, segregation, and, you know, we're trying to make people aware of what the Indigenous people are still dealing with today. Overnight, Indigenous protesters arrived on Parliament Hill. There was a confrontation with police as they tried to put up a ceremonial teepee. Several were detained and charged with trespassing. They were eventually allowed to proceed, and the teepee is expected to stay up throughout the long weekend. Canadian Blood Services has warned that donations are critically low heading into the summer. But one Toronto gay man is pointing out he had to abstain from having sex for a whole year just to be eligible to give blood. And while Ottawa has reduced the abstinence period from five years to one, many say the rules for gay men who want to donate blood are still too strict. Philippe de Montigny reports. It does limit what you can do in the bedroom. This gay man from Toronto, whose identity CBC News has agreed to protect, has gone for an entire year without sex, just so he could give blood. That's the Canadian deferral period for men who have sex with men. The 28-year-old was able to give in December of last year, and again in April, while in a committed relationship. I do wish that I could both give blood and not feel like I'm missing out on something uh, with somebody I care about. The policy evolved from a complete ban to a five-year abstinence period in 2013. That was changed to one year last August. Why one year? Nobody can say exactly, except that gay and bisexual men are statistically at higher risk of contracting HIV. This infectious diseases specialist questions the whole purpose of a deferral period since all donated blood is tested rigorously. He says detecting the virus used to take three months, but now results can be conclusive almost immediately as we appreciate how good the diagnostic tests are for infections like HIV in the blood bank. And uh, we, we might see some changes in policy in the next, in the next uh, months or years to come. Some countries like Spain and Italy already got rid of their deferral period. Even though Canadian Blood Services could benefit from extra donors since its current reserve heading into the summer is at a low point, the organization says more evidence is needed. We continue to look at ways that we can reduce that time period based on research. Uh, but uh, we still have to follow all the processes that are, you know, that are in place. In the next few months, the National Blood Bank will hand out nearly $3 million in research grants. The goal is to review donor eligibility criteria and screening for men who have sex with men. And all this could mean changing Health Canada's policy once again. Philippe de Montigny, CBC News, Toronto. Officials are investigating an explosion at a cafe in Vaughan, Ontario. We would deem this as structurally unstable at this point in time. You see that behind me there are some walls down. The blast happened shortly before 5.30 Eastern time this morning. One person suffered non-life-threatening injuries and has been taken into custody in connection with the explosion. No other injuries have been reported. Police are treating the blast as suspicious. The cafe is known to police from an illegal gaming probe, but investigators are not drawing any conclusions yet. 
Well, a version of Donald Trump's controversial travel ban is about to come into effect. After months of legal wrangling, portions of the U.S. president's executive order will be rolled out. The guidelines are aimed specifically at travelers from six majority Muslim countries. Stephen D'Souza has the story. It was business as usual at JFK in New York today. It's a far cry from a few months ago when protesters descended on Terminal 4 and dozens of lawyers mobilized to help those caught up in Donald Trump's travel ban. One of the most encouraging. Now lawyers are again preparing to fight the latest version of the ban. We are mobilized. We, we've been speaking with um, well over a thousand attorneys over the last few days that are prepared to be at the airports, that plan to be at the airport should anybody have any issues. The new travel ban goes into effect tonight. The first two versions were blocked by the courts, that is, until Monday, when the Supreme Court allowed some parts of it to go ahead. The travel restrictions apply to people from six predominantly Muslim countries, Iran, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, Syria, and Yemen. The difference now, travelers who can prove a bona fide relationship to the U.S. are exempt, but what that means is already the subject of debate. Those with immediate family, like parents or children, as well as green card holders, will be allowed in. So, too, anyone accepting a job from a U.S. company or speaking at an American university. Those with extended family, like aunts, uncles or grandparents, aren't eligible. Refugees who don't have a connection are likely to be stopped. Vacationers, as well as people trying to use connections to aid groups, could also face problems. I think it's ridiculous. It's, it's an attack on what family means, right? And it's clearly not what the Supreme Court intended. Mackler says she doesn't expect chaos at the airports with people being turned away. She says that drama will play out at consulates overseas. She also expects chaos in the courts as lawyers challenge what constitutes a bona fide relationship. And all of this will come before the Supreme Court hears arguments on the travel ban in the fall. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, New York. Adele's hello is about to become goodbye. The singer has confirmed that her current string of Wembley shows will indeed be her last. She revealed to fans in a handwritten letter that touring just doesn't suit her. And that she wanted her final shows to be at home in London. That last show is this Sunday.
Well, a rare encounter in this next story, and for that, we take you to Tennessee. This is where Calvin Lee says he captured an albino raccoon. Mm. Lee says he noticed something tearing up his grass, so he decided to set a trap. Surprise, here's the thing when it comes to albino raccoons. They can have a tough time surviving in the wild because, of course, their lighter coats make it hard for them to hide very well. Lee says he's still waiting to hear back from authorities on what he should do with the animal. Oh, it looks so sweet. <laughs> well, remember Bodie McBoatface? Now you might recall these pictures from the launch of that creatively christened ship, the Yellow Submarine, sent to explore deep waters near the Antarctic. Well, Bodie McBoatface is back, and scientists say it collected unprecedented d data on its maiden voyage. It reached that depths of 4,000 meters, tracking things like temperature and water flow. Scientists hope the data will help them understand how mixing ocean waters play into climate change. Cool. Love the name. Can't get any better than Bodie McBoke face. Uh, okay, uh, temperatures tomorrow in that 20 to as warm as 23, 24 degrees range in the uh, metro. Good risk of uh, thunderstorms and showers from Corner Brook to Central. Keep that in mind. We're clearing out in Labrador. In case you missed it, there's a long weekend outlook for you. Again, temperatures not so great Saturday, Sunday here in the east as winds shift northerly. We will rebound Monday, but we do have a good chance of showers on the menu. And again, the temperatures not half bad in central and uh, Labrador a little cooler than seasonal, especially towards Sunday and Monday. You know, I would be hard pressed to think of another place in the world where you can wow. have both icebergs <sighs> and thunderstorms in the same picture wow. at the same time and this one is a beautiful shot this was taken this afternoon we were talking about those thunderstorms and rosalie snapped this in badger bay along the north coast of newfoundland and what a shot there oh. and they were racing away from the thunderstorm and they mm -hmm. uh, did make it in safe and sound and you gotta yeah. love the flag just splitting it right down the middle there <laughs> that is a great shot well thanks very much rosalie Good that they got out of the way of all that metal on that boat. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Not a good place to be. <laughs> and uh, I hope you have a great night tonight. It's a good place to be, whatever you're at, as they say. And we'll see you back here tomorrow. <laughs> good night.